and get, every, get going. We have about 24 people on the call. Um, can you still hear me? Absolutely, okay. yes. We have about 24 people um, on the call and uh, people will probably join as we get going. Um, I just want you to uh, also uh, know um, Reno Deaton, who is the executive director for the Greer Development Corporation. Um, this is a program uh, that he and I with the Chamber of Commerce um, got together and uh, put this forward. Um, Tony Kay was a uh, instrumental in, in getting this set up and we really appreciate all the help from the, the Pelham staff. But uh, Dr. Lombardozzi, before I turn this over to you, um, I'm, we have a few questions that we had sent you and I'll just probably mute myself after we get started. And if you have any um, uh, more questions like that, there's a chat piece to this and feel free to chat with me um, as well. So with that, um, I'd like to introduce everyone to Dr. Uh, Chris Lombardozzi, the Chief Medical Officer, Quality of Spartanburg Regional Healthcare System, and welcome to this program today. I'll just turn it over to you now. Thank you. Great, thank you, David. I appreciate it, and I appreciate everybody's time today. Um, these are certainly trying times, a lot of confusion, a lot of concern, uh, justifiably so. And let me start by, by thanking all of you for, for making the sacrifices that you're making. It, it may not make a whole lot of sense um, to have a bunch of businesses closed and people's lives disrupted. But I can tell you as a healthcare provider, I've been, been an emergency medicine doctor for close to 25 years now. And my wife is a trauma surgeon and, and certainly in my, my role as a, uh, a medical administrator, um, I'm well aware of what can happen. Most of you are, are by now familiar with uh, coronavirus 19 or COVID-19 as I'll refer to it moving on. And You've probably heard the, the terms flattening the curve and all the all these measures, the social distancing and uh, businesses being asked to shut down and, and really limiting contact from person to person are an attempt to do just that so that organizations like ours can manage through what we expect to see in the next few weeks, which would be a spike in, in cases that require hospitalization or intensive care. And if you don't manage that spike, then, then you end up with resource depletion in a very short period of time, uh, which forces you to make really, really tough decisions that we would prefer not to have to make. Um, you've seen uh, some difficult stories in New York and certainly Italy and, and some other European countries that have really struggled through this. So we're hopeful and I think well, well prepared now uh, for what may come in the next few weeks um, to, to manage the, the communities that we serve. So I um, just want to say that, say that up front. Um, you know, my background, for those of you who've, who've never met me, I am an emergency medicine doctor, um, trained, did my, my residency training up in Indianapolis, uh, where I met my wife, who's a trauma surgeon and director of critical care. So between the two of us, you've got a, a wealth of experience. In addition to that, I've been an uh, EMS, Spartanburg County EMS director for over 15 years. I'm currently the Cherokee uh, county medical director for EMS, and I had also been uh, Regional One, our, our flight program's medical director for 10 years. And I've been involved in a variety of emergency preparedness um, over the years, in, including responses to Katrina and Harvey uh, a couple of years ago in, in Houston. So uh, with that, uh, I'll, I'll get started with a few of the questions that have been um, submitted and uh, feel free when, when I'm finished, if, if you've got more, I'm, I'm more than happy to answer anything you've got. Um, I will say that one of the things that, that is very difficult about this situation is that we're learning as we go. Uh, you know, coronavirus was first noticed, this particular coronavirus was first noticed in, in China in mid-December. Um, I don't need to um, remind everyone of what happened over there. But if you if you can imagine, we've only known about this since December. It's now uh, the end of March. That's not a whole lot of time to learn. Uh, so we're basing a lot of what we've done, a lot of what's been done, on past experience with uh, other viruses. We've seen coronaviruses before. In fact, for the most part, they tend to be more like a common cold virus. Uh, but what what's happened here is that this one is new to us, to us as as humans. And so, as is often the case, when 
we encounter a, a new uh, problem, um, we respond to it in, in different ways. I imagine that if we're talking about this a year or two down the road, then coronavirus 19 is just one of a litany of other typical uh, seasonal viruses that, that we encounter and don't experience quite the, the same uh, pandemics that we're experiencing this year. Um, just so you know, in terms of you know cough, cold type viruses, uh, there are a couple of viruses that we we check for that are coronaviruses that r regularly and, and and often infect communities, but but show very very mild symptoms, and so we don't worry about them at all. And uh, moving forward, we would hope that 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 turns out to be the case in the future. But for now, that's not the case. And so all these measures we're taking are, are really important to uh, help mitigate the spread and the rate of, sp of spread so that we as a healthcare system can, can manage it. So let me move into the questions. There was a, a question here about uh, medical procedures. So if I've got a medical procedure, it's scheduled at a hospital and that hospital is treating coronavirus patients, is it safe for me to go to the hospital for that or, or should I postpone? And, and I will say that at this point, Virtually every hospital in the country, in fact, I'm not sure of any that haven't at this point gone to what we've done, which is to defer or delay what we consider to be truly elective procedures. Now, an elective procedure is something that's not going to cause any undue harm to the person if it's delayed. So, for instance, you just turned 50 years old and you're supposed to get a colonoscopy as a general screening exam. Um, for for uh, colon cancer. Well, whether you get it this month or three months from now or four months, five months from now, probably doesn't make a whole lot of difference. That's the sort of, of procedure that can easily be deferred or delayed um, until uh, the situation has changed. However, let's say you have cancer and the treatment for that is is an aggressive surgery. Well, that's not something that can be delayed and we'll still do those procedures. If you're in a car accident, you break a bone or have a head injury, those would be treated immediately. If you come into the emergency department with appendicitis, that's going to be treated immediately. So we're still taking care of the things we have to take care of. And, and I would, you know, as a, as a sort of more broad answer, um, virtually everything we do right now in the hospitals is still not coronavirus. It's everything else. It's the normal um, illness and injury that we manage on a regular basis. So the heart attacks and the strokes, the the typical surgical uh, things that we see, all of those are being managed in our hospitals and in other hospitals like they are every single day of the week um, and, and will be in the future. So the other way to find out is to call your doctor. And if, you know, again, most offices are, are well equipped to answer those questions at this, at this time they will notify you, I would say, 99% of the time, so you probably don't even have to worry about answering that question. And if they feel like this is something that can or should be postponed, then they will. And, and there are two reasons for that. One is just bringing you into, the, into a hospital where there may be uh, coronavirus. And at this point, with pretty much community spread throughout the country, including South Carolina, uh, I think it's fair to say that, that you know, the risk virtually anywhere is, is, uh, is there, uh, maybe not like New York, but, but uh, clearly no matter where you go, there's some risk. So anything you can do to mitigate that risk where you don't have to have it uh, would be important. Um, so your, your offices can, can answer those questions about doing procedures. The next question is related to hydroxychloroquine. And the question is, are there new FDA approved um, uh, hydroxychloroquine, uh, so there, it's two, there's a two-part question to this. One is, is SRHS going to start testing this drug? And the, the unwritten question here is, are we using it? So the first part of that, we don't test drugs unless it's part of a clinical study. Um, we're not a research center, although we do participate in a variety of clinical trials. Um, we are not participating in a clinical trial of hydroxychloroquine. It's a drug that's well known to the medical profession. We've used it for malaria and other um, indications over the years. We, we will be using it in specific cases. 
like a lot of medicines, there are um, some significant side effects. And in this case, in, in particular, some heart side effects, cardiac side effects that, that you've got to be careful of. So it's not the right medicine for every patient. And quite frankly, it may not be the, the right medicine for most patients. So we'll use it when it's indicated. Um, we don't expect to use it for very many patients unless they're very sick. Um, next question, can the virus live on surfaces, or since the virus can live on surfaces for some time, how do I make sure deliveries of mail packages, groceries, or newspapers are safe? And you know, there, there are a couple of questions on here related to this type of thing, packages, groceries, something you get in the mail. And I think for the most part, that's not really where you should be focusing your concern. Um, if you can maintain good hand hygiene, then the, the, the risk from, um, from what we call fomites or, or the organism living on a piece of cardboard or a piece of paper or uh, some grocery item, a can or something like that is, is really pretty small. Um, what, what, is in, uh, what, what we know to be effective is great hand hygiene. And, and, and it sounds boring, but washing your hands and then washing your hands and then washing your hands and then washing your hands is more effective than anything else that we do. And, and part of that is because no matter who we are, most of us put our hands on our face fairly frequently. And the, the fact that I just mentioned that in the next 60 seconds while you're listening to me, Notice how many times you have an inclination to put your hand to your nose or your hand to your glasses or your hand to your ears or your mouth. Um, it, it is amazing how often we, we want to uh, touch our face. So having great hand hygiene keeps whatever organism is out there from getting onto your face and into the mucous membranes of your nose and your mouth and your eyes. So focus on that. Don't worry about the the articles of clothing or the groceries or the, um, the packages that may arrive at your home. Um, next question is related to canceling routine dentist or doctor appointments. And I think this sort of goes back to the first one, although um, your routine visits are not in hospitals, most doctors or dentists at this point have either notified their, their patients that they're deferring or delaying um, normal exams, or they've created uh, different scheduling. Many of our offices are currently performing well visits during the morning, and then what we determine to be sick visits in the afternoon, and that allows for some uh, preparation and differentiation uh, of that those different patient populations. Can I get my hair cut or have a pedicure or a massage? Uh, I will tell you that my, my daughters, who are both teenagers, are joking with me that um, they've never seen me with long hair ever. Uh, I still do have my hair, uh, so that's good news. But I imagine after a couple of months without um, going to get my hair cut, I'm going to have a ponytail, and um, we'll, we'll see. It's going to be a completely different look for me. Uh, I would say that, again, most of the barbershops, the salons, have probably already shut down or have limited hours. If not, it's okay to go get your hair cut. Uh, we're, we're trying to advise people that you know, no more than a couple of people at a time. So I think some of the salons are doing um, hair cutting by appointment only, and it's only one-to-one. -one. Um, there is you know, some risk, it's, it's pretty minimal, uh, but assuming that your hair cutter does not have uh, symptoms and is otherwise okay, then the risk of, of getting coronavirus from that person is, is really low. Uh, next question, again, kind of gets back to the, the, the products and packages that arrive at, at your home. Um, should I wipe down all of my grocery products and packages before bringing them into my home to prevent transfer um, onto my countertops and shelves? And the answer is no. There's really no need to wipe down packages or grocery products. Um, COVID, for the most part, is spread person to person by droplets, which means sneezing and coughing. So again, it gets back to the boring stuff, but good hand hygiene, disinfecting your own solid surfaces. So certainly your kitchen countertops and your tables, your desk, um, those surfaces should be should be disinfected regularly. And standard cleaning solutions, you know, the the, the Lysol or the uh, the Clorox um, solutions that are out there, the standard wipes, 
are perfectly adequate for this. This is actually a really easy virus to kill. Um, the CDC has three tiers of, of um, sort of the, the, the ability to kill a virus. The third tier is the weakest form of, of a virus, and that's the, the tier that this one falls into in terms of um, um, using alcohol-based uh, preparations. So, um, so really easy to kill. Just wipe down your, your solid surfaces. Um, that should be more than enough. Next question is about a BiPAP machine, and it says, is, there, is a BiPAP machine an acceptable alternative for a respirator? And, and I'm going to expand the question a little bit. I'm, I'm not exactly sure um, what this person was asking. So let me, let me say first, a BiPAP machine is, is not the same as a respirator, and, and therefore determining whether it's an acceptable alternative is completely dependent on the the condition of the patient and what they need. So if you back up a little bit, BiPAP machines are, are fairly common. A lot of folks have what we call CPAP machines. Um, those are continuous positive airway pressure machines that they'll use at home. Most common indication for that would be sleep apnea, a person who, who stops breathing at night and that those machines help them with that. The BiPAP machine um, forces in, in air uh, similarly um, and we use that in hospitals often with people who have uh, heart failure or pneumonia but don't require mechanical ventilation. The one caveat, and this is something we have had to change uh, in terms of hospital care, is that with the COVID-19 um, pandemic, we don't want to spread viruses inadvertently. And machines like a BiPAP machine can do that in, um, in locations where they're not, um, not appropriately situated. And by that, they, they, in a hospital setting, we have rooms called negative pressure or isolation rooms where you can do that um, more safely than if you were to do it in an open space. So unfortunately for, for many sick patients who have COVID-19 um, and are declining, we may, rather than using that form of therapy, we may choose to put someone on, on a mechanical ventilator because it's safer for the, the staff. And also, and, and this is good news, we've also found out that that more aggressive form of treatment is actually better in terms of the long-term outcome. So that works hand in hand and, and makes it a little bit easier for the, the medical staff. Uh, next question is related to uh, what do I do after I get it? So I get the virus, and then I recover. Am I immune? And the answer is we don't know. Uh, there are a variety of studies going on. I'm, I'm aware of at least one in China. I believe there's one going on in Colorado right now to look at this. And what I can say is that based on previous um, experience with, with most viruses, um, th that would be true, that after you've been exposed to a virus, uh, at least once and recovered, then we tend to have immunity moving forward into the future. And, and the, the best way to explain that, for any of you who've had small children, you know that in those first couple of years of life, it seems like they are, they are petri dishes for runny noses and, and um, um, coughs and colds, uh, seems like almost endlessly. And then as they get to be about four or five years old, that just doesn't happen anymore as they build up immunity to the common cough and cold viruses that we see on a regular basis. So, so definitely that happens. Now, whether that will happen or to what degree, we just don't know with this particular virus. Uh, there are some studies that will be out there, and I'm sure within, again, within a year or so, there will be the ability to do blood tests and show whether you are or, or are not immune. Um, but that sort of testing is still somewhat distant and, and certainly not going to help us much in the next few months. Next question is related to beds. Um, how many beds does SRHS have for uh, patients? And um, the best way to answer this is that we're, we're in a really good position. The, the, the ability to, to have um, multiple acute care hospitals gives us flexibility that uh, most other healthcare systems probably don't have. So we've got well over 700 or 750 adult beds in our system, but we also have the ability to flex those if needed um, to, to account for more patients. Um, 
speaking more broadly, we just like uh, all the, the certainly all the hospitals in the upstate, and I'm fairly certain most of the other hospitals in South Carolina have expansion plans. So if we need to, we can we can move care into offsite settings uh, where we can take care of either COVID or non-COVID patients. So we've got a lot of options in front of us, and we feel pretty good about the, the plan and the resources that we have at our disposal. Uh, next question is related to tests and test kits. How many tests are available in the upstate? I think it's fair to say you've all seen it in the news that when this uh, really got going, we did not have enough testing availability to do widespread testing. So we followed, as did everyone else, and, and continue to follow the CDC recommendations. There are tiers of recommendations that um, essentially go from the, the sickest people and healthcare workers down to what, what they call epidemiology studies, which, which is where you just go out and do broad scale testing of, of almost anyone just to see uh, how widespread the, the illness is in the community. We are not anywhere near that point uh, yet. Where we are is what we would call tier one and tier two with slight expansion into tier three. So tier ones and twos involve the, the most vulnerable and sickest patients and healthcare workers. Tier three is the person who doesn't re necessarily require hospitalization, but for whom it would be nice to know if they have it or don't have it. Um, for for that, we've, we've set up um, outpatient testing. Initially, that was done at our MGC offices and at our intermediate care centers. Um, as of yesterday, we now have drive-through testing at USC Upstate, and we'll have locations in Gaffney and Union um, as of uh, Wednesday. That testing, again, just like everywhere else in the country, is dependent on symptoms. So someone who does not have symptoms will not be tested. So you can't just drive up and say, I want to get a test. And, and get one. You do have to have symptoms and you do have to have a doctor's order in order to get a, a test. So screening is done a variety of ways. You can call your doctor and have a visit through your primary care doctor. In our system, you can use my chart and what we call an e-visit where you uh, fill out a questionnaire and then interact with one of our physicians uh, by email and then they'll direct you uh, where you need to go. Uh, or you can visit one of our intermediate care centers and they'll do a screening there as well. So lots of options. Clearly, if someone is, is sick enough to be hospitalized, then uh, they are referred to our emergency departments and we take care of them in our, in our hospitals. Next question is related to if I have symptoms, um, where should I go? And, and that's really the answer I, I just gave. Um, if you've got symptoms, the first thing to do is get screened. And the easiest way to do that is a phone call to your primary care doctor or some form of virtual visit. That would be the e-visits that we have through my chart. Um, MUSC offers a free virtual visit. Uh, just go to musc.virtual and I believe they have a promo called uh, promo code uh, COVID-19 and that's a free service. And if, if uh, someone screens positive then they'll be referred to one of our um, sites for further evaluation and testing as needed. Uh, another question, I've seen rumors that a loss of the sense of taste is a symptom for a carrier. Is there any truth to this? So this is a, this is a yes and answer. Um, loss of taste can be a symptom. Um, it's not common uh, or, or it's not common for this particular virus, but it is not an unusual characteristic of virtually anything that involves the nose or throat um, or, or lungs and uh, not an uncommon uh, symptom for virtually any uh, respiratory virus. So um, could be, um, I wouldn't, um, wouldn't bet the house on it if that were the only symptom you had. Another question, what should I do if I've been in contact with someone who may have been exposed to COVID-19? Um, this is a great question and probably one of the most common ones that we get asked. And, and really, it still comes down to symptoms. Um, if you're not sick, if you don't have symptoms, then there really isn't much to do. 
many people have probably come into contact with someone who has COVID-19 and are doing just fine. The statistics on this are still uh, coming. You know, again, we won't have great data until probably several months down the road, but uh, clearly the vast majority of people who contract this virus are not getting terribly sick. They may have very mild symptoms um, that they don't even notice, maybe a little runny nose or scratchy throat. Uh, most are not getting terribly sick. Then there's about 20% or so who have some significant symptoms uh, of which probably 80 to 90% of that 20%, those symptoms are, are flu-like type symptoms, uh, the sort of thing that would certainly keep you home if, if, if this were ordinary flu, um, probably take a week or so to recover. Um, that's the, the, the sort of the normal course that we're seeing for most people diagnosed with COVID. And then there's a, a small amount, about 5% of the total, who are sick enough to um, require hospitalization. Um, and that seems to be uh, pretty consistent across the board. Um, not all of those will, will require intensive care, uh, but, but some of them will require uh, that, that form of high-level care. So again, to answer that question, if you don't have symptoms, there really isn't anything to do. Stick to the standard precautions. Uh, really good hand hygiene, social distancing, um, disinfect those solid surfaces. And those are the things that are going to really keep everybody healthy. Uh, another question, can COVID-19 be passed to or from my pet? Um, I think this is very, very unlikely. Um, we are uh, Certainly, I'm not aware of any evidence to, to suggest that that uh, can occur. I won't say that it can't because the moment I say that it can't, someone will, will find a study somewhere or an anecdote somewhere. But I think that's, that, uh, again, based on what we know of uh, coronaviruses from the past and other typical respiratory uh, uh, viruses, it's pretty unlikely. Um, and then the last question, I think we've actually I've answered this already, but it's sort of a repeat. If a person thinks they've already had COVID-19, uh, but were not tested during their symptoms, is there a test they could do now to check for antibodies? And if so, can they get that test? And, and again, the answer is not yet. Eventually, there will be testing for antibodies, and, and that will be very helpful. But for now, there's not. Um, that's the end of the questions. But if you don't mind, I'm going to just touch on just one or two other things that, that I hear a lot and were not listed here. And that's, one, how long does it take for a test to come back? And uh, you've probably seen in the news that it's still um, somewhere in the four to seven day range. That is still consistent. Uh, there are a variety of, of testing uh, companies, both private and uh, public. DHEC does testing as well as uh, companies like LabCorp and Quest and others. And as you might imagine, um, they are completely overwhelmed. So the, the uh, testing delays are real. Uh, they take somewhere in the four to seven day range. Uh, the good news is that if you were symptomatic and we tested you, then our instructions to you are going to be the same regardless, which is go home, stay home, practice all the good hand hygiene, um, make sure that you're, you're doing all the things that you need to do to be safe with your family, and then you'll wait for that test to come back. If the test comes back in a few days and it's negative, then that's great. You probably have a typical cough, cold, or flu, and you can do what you would do ordinarily. If the test comes back positive, then you're already doing the things that you need to do by staying home, and uh, we'll, we will follow up with you on further instructions about how to manage that until you hit about the 14-day mark. Uh, once you hit 14 days, assuming that you're doing well and have been doing well for a few days, um, then uh, you can be uh, relieved of, of that quarantine and that social isolation. Uh, the other question that I get related to testing is, is there a rapid test available? And the answer is yes and. And the and is it is available only to um, uh, very small sites right now. Uh, there are, again, just a couple of companies that provide this. There have been issues with supplies and supply chain and so the, the, the answer in the upstate is it's not readily available at this time. I can tell you that every healthcare system in the country would love to have a rapid test. I imagine that every 
patient, every patient's family, every administrator, everyone who's remotely involved with COVID-19 right now would love to have a rapid test. It would greatly expedite what we do. It would allow us to give clear and direct information to people um, in almost real time, and it would allow us to um, to, to reduce the amount of resources that, uh, that we're using as we wait for um, test results to come back. So that's probably plenty of me talking. Um, I'll uh, grab a quick drink here and, and uh, wait for some questions if you have any. Dr. Lombard, Dozy, thank you so much for, excuse me, I'm frogging my throat. Thank you so much for being part of this. Um, I'm not quite sure how to do, uh, uh, we have about 28, uh, 29 people on, uh, that includes you and I, um, and I'm not quite sure how to do questions, but if someone wants, there's a chat, um, there's a chat piece, if someone wants to shoot a chat out to everyone, we can either read it aloud or um, uh, if you do have time, I don't know what's your time. Maybe, uh, maybe, if, um, maybe if they send it to you and then you can, um, uh, sure. You can ask the question that way. We we did a chamber, uh, Spornberg chamber, uh, a few days ago, and one of the problems, of course, as you might imagine, is everybody starts talking and, and then no one can hear anything. So, if if they could send a quick text or email or however you'd like to receive that, okay. and then uh, you you can just ask, and that's probably the best easiest way to do this. Great. On the um, the the Zoom uh, group chat at the very bottom, there's a there's a chat button. If you click on that, you can find my name. Uh, it's David Merheb. Just click on that, and you can send me a, a private message. I'll be happy to read any question. But I appreciate all the information uh, that you shared with us uh, thus far. I can only imagine what you're going through. We want to thank you uh, for all your hard work and for your your team's hard work. Um, uh, thus far, it's it's uh, quite remarkable what what the healthcare is going through and how they're handling it. What everything I've read's been uh, pretty positive. So thank you. Well, you're very welcome. We have a we have a great great team here. I know you guys know Tony K real well, and it's uh, it is quite a challenge for everybody. I, I not for a second, and I think it's important to say this maybe more than once. Not for a second do we take lightly the, the sacrifices that are being made by the community um, in order to help us to be prepared for what, what may be coming. Great. I am not seeing any questions at this time. Um, so on, on behalf of the, of the uh, Greater Development Corporation and the Greater Greater Chamber of Commerce and uh, Pelham Medical Center, I just wanna thank you so much for joining us today. Um, and we are, did record this. We're gonna we'll put it out on our uh, chamber um, Greer Chamber Live uh, Facebook or not Facebook, but um, our YouTube channel. And uh, if anything else comes in, I'll be sure to uh, touch base. But again, thank you so much for all that you're doing for our uh, for our community. You're welcome. You're welcome. Thank you very much.